brain-computer interfaces. It's a direct communication between the brain's electrical activity and the external device, most commonly a computer or robotic limb. Elon Musk and Neuralink, Met Angle and Paradromics, now Connor Glass and Phantom Neuro. There are many different approaches. Now let's hear from Connor why Phantom Neuro is going to be the future in this space. Harnessing muscle in the way that we're doing it in order to control these robotic technologies will be the most natural way to do it. We control our limbs with muscle, so it makes sense and is the most naturalistic way to control robotic appendages. It's also through muscle. I think it'll be the best way to control these technologies, the safest way to control these technologies, and the most desirable way to control these technologies. Connor spun Phantom Neuro out of John Hopkins and is the perfect guest to talk about what he is building as well as the future of BCI technology. There are timestamps and show notes below. If you like this type of content, please subscribe and comment. Let's stay curious curious and learn about Connor Glass in this episode of the Learn With Wall Show. For people who are not familiar with what you're, you're building, uh, roughly what is it? Like, can you describe it to us? Yeah, so it's it's hard because it's not extremely straightforward, but it, we're creating a muscle machine interface. So a lot of people have heard brain machine interfaces. Um, Neuralink is obviously the most prominent just simply because of Elon. Uh, but similar concept to that, I'm building out, we're building out a system that allows for lifelike control of robotic hardware, meaning prosthetic limbs, exoskeletons, uh, maybe one day exosuits, um, active braces. So, you know, people know about wrist braces that are static, basically hold your arm, your hand in place, uh, trying to control braces that potentially would allow you to move your wrist again. You know, people have wrist drop, foot drop, um, different ailments like that. So we're creating an implantable sensor system that goes within the limb that's affected, either an amputation stump or an intact limb that has nerve damage or, or whatever it might be uh, that records muscle signals and then converts those muscle signals into commands for a prosthetic or an exoskeleton or an active brace uh, or anything like that. So really we're creating a platform control system uh, for robotic technology. So um, just so like we can really diverge it, what, what about the system is in, in a sense like off the shelf in terms of technology and what is uniquely being developed with you? Because I, I yeah. think a lot of times people feel that you have to do like 100% innovation, but most of the time it's like 30%. But I'm curious, like, what is the 30% special sauce? I to I completely agree with you. So I, I think that, you know, there's a fine balance between biting off more than you can chew and doing something that's that's not novel at all, right? Because typically if you're going for 100% novel, then you're really funding academic research in a way uh, where you're putting a lot of money into R&D for something that you aren't sure is going to work. And that's that's a risky thing to do unless you have just a bunch of capital available to you and, and you know, the stomach to be able to do that. Um, so I would say we're probably more than 30% novel in what we're doing, but uh, the principles behind everything that we're doing um, are not necessarily novel. So we're benefiting from decades of research in the field uh, where, you know, so the government put in a ton of funding into how can amputees, people with quadriplegia, all these different um, types of disease states, how can they control robotic appendages or, or the outside world, mouse cursors on a screen. Uh, and so through that funding, all these different types of technologies and approaches to human machine interfacing were tested. So wearable sensors, implantable sensors, sensors that kind of go through the skin and plug into muscle, all these different things. Uh, and so there's a lot of literature, you know, academic literature on all these different approaches to human machine interfacing, what works, what doesn't work. Um, all the way, you know, from rats through to humans for chronic studies. Uh, and so what we're doing is we're packaging up the principles that work and get, getting rid of the things that don't work in the literature uh, and turning them into a commercial system for the mass public to be able to use uh, for the patient populations. So our field in particular um, has kind of suffered from a translational gap. And what that means is a gap of research actually turning into net benefit to the, the general population. So billions of dollars have been spent on prosthetic control, you know, computer control, all of these things, but the actual patient outcomes in the general population. So people that are not participants in these studies, they haven't seen much benefit. So their quality of life has not tangibly improved over the past decades, despite billions of dollars of research trying to get their lives to improve. And so it's about how do you take the scientific principles that we've learned with all of that money and then package them into something commercial that the general population can use. Uh, and the way to do that is to harness things that we already know work, but package them together in a novel way. So the powering mechanisms, um, for example, inductive powering and recharging, something that your cell phone uses when you put it on a, on a mat to charge wirelessly, uh, that kind of technology. 
sensor technology directed at muscle, uh, flexible electronics, um, wireless methods of communication. All of these things already exist in the ether and in all other, other uh, implantable systems or cell phones or computers or whatever. Um, we're just picking all the pieces that we like and putting them together into a completely novel system. Um, Another novel side of what we're doing is on the machine learning and artificial intelligence side, you know, so really machine learning is, is a true art form as I've come to learn, you know, that's obviously not my specialty whatsoever, but as I've hired really great people and interacted with people that do this, it's an art form where everybody does things differently. And there are some speed, you know, secret special sauces that you can have uh, to get really, really good results. Uh, and so if you find the right people, you can get some really novel things happening. Uh, and signal processing and machine learning. And so we're benefiting from that. Um, so hopefully that answered your question that there's a lot of novel things going on, but we're not creating some entirely new source of power, you know, like fusion energy or, or something like that. We're, we're taking things that we know work uh, and packaging them into a novel form factor and, and uh, novel purpose. That makes sense. The, there's tech transfers at pretty much every university and I think it, I think the the percentage is like ninety seven percent or ninety eight percent of uh, IP that's generated that literally goes nowhere, and nowhere. Uh, that's taxpayer money. And they're just a lot of the times so you don't really even have to give them all that much to get, get exclusive rights and stuff. Depending on the well, it depends I mean, it's on like it CRISPR. Depends. Yeah, if it's like CRISPR, you're gonna have to pay a lot. <laughs> it depends. Well, I mean, it's 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 almost like a self selecting thing where the more promising the IP. You know, mm. generally, if it's a home run, everybody recognizes it's a home run potentially. And so the institution will, you know, guard that very preciously. Whereas if there's a piece of IP that's been sitting there, you know, that no one's really, no one really knows exists, uh, there's probably a reason it's been sitting there potentially. Mm. And so you could probably get really good terms, especially if that IP is already at the end of its shelf life, you know, with respect to the 20 years or whatever it is that a patent's lifetime is. Um, but no, it's, it's incredibly difficult to get IP out of academic institutions and commercialize them. Uh, it's easier if you're a large corporation and then you come in uh, and then you're just willing to pay a whole bunch of fees and do all of those things. But to be a startup where your foundational IP is within academia, it's really, really difficult to get it out of uh, the institution into your own company. So for example, uh, I did my research fellowship at Johns Hopkins um, and submitted a patent. So I'm the primary inventor on this patent that we submitted at Johns Hopkins, but still I had to go through a, a multi-month process of getting that patent out uh, so that my company could get off the ground uh, and start doing something. So it, it's never easy, even with the best relationships and, and all of that. That's interesting. Um, is that, was there a lot, I mean, I'm just wondering like how much IP was there that you needed to have those negotiations versus like how many, how much was just in the public domain? Um, and then eventually, I assume you just got a lawyer. <laughs> it's like, please help. You have to have a lawyer. So I, I mean, yeah. I, I, I truly believe that you have to have a lawyer. They're so these contracts are so complex. Uh, the academic institutions are backed by a whole cadre of lawyers. So for you to not have a lawyer, uh, to not know what's possible, what's not possible, I think you're putting yourself at a significant disadvantage. The flip side of that is you need tens of thousands of dollars mm. uh, somehow uh, available to you to be able to hire that lawyer to get the IP out of the, the institution. So it's a double-edged sword for sure, um, but to your advantage to have some kind of representation. I've heard that some lawyers will like defer their fees, assuming they're gonna make more off of you in the long term. So it's easier for startups to get off the ground in the short term. Is that not the case with uh, no, so tech? That's, oh, no, that's, absolute, that's absolute, absolutely the case for like uh, venture capital lawyers. Mm -hmm. So if you're going into an investment round and you're receiving X number of dollars investment, well, you need the lawyers to get those X dollars, but you also need X dollars to be able to get the lawyers, right, to hire them. And so those lawyers will typically defer their payment until after the closing of the round. And so right after you close, you get your bill and you back pay basically everything that you've incurred uh, to that point in order to receive the funding. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, it's interesting, but tech is more interesting. So let's go back to that. Um, when it comes to the sensor, the machine learning, the implementation of it is there an aspect of it in particular that you're going to be spearheading on or are you more like the like the, the brain and, and the rest of your team are like the hands and the arms working on the different parts of it uh so what do you mean myself spearheading or or yeah. the like are, uh, are you um like are you gonna be like the generals of the team or are you gonna be leading and engineering and oh uh, no i'm i am very i'm very much the generalist of the team uh so i i consider myself a specialist with 
respect to the medicine side of it and maybe some of the invasive surgical sides of it, because that's, I did a, a lot of research in that. Um, but as far as the machine learning, actual robotics itself, uh, the, uh, you know, electrical engineering, the mechanical engineering, all of that absolutely rely on specialists that are not myself uh, to do that. And so I'm more just have the vision uh, for what we're trying to work towards uh, and some of the connections and then, you know, found the right people to be able to execute on that vision uh, and sort out much of the detail. Makes sense. Well, you, I believe you're trained as a surgeon. So I'll ask you a question about surgery. The, do you, uh, is this going to be like an outpatient thing in the, in the, in terms of kind of like what Neuralink is doing, where they just have like a machine that's going to implant into people and you can kind of be in and out fast, or are you going to have to, um, have like a real specialist implant this into people? It's a great question. First of all, I'm not a surgeon. Actually, I, uh, I thought you trained I, as a surgeon. I, so I did not go to residency. I did medical okay. school. Then I did a two year research fellowship in plastic surgery. So that was, I did surgery on animal models, everything from rodents to primates. Uh, you know, studying all these advanced microsurgery techniques. Uh, <clears throat> but it's very common to do research before you go on to plastic surgery residency because mm. it's so hard to get into, uh, especially in this kind of field where it's very niche and, and you kind of have to have your foot in the door um, to go down that path. And so it was in that interim period while I was doing research that I decided, uh, you know what, I think I'm going to start this company and do that instead of going to residency. So I didn't actually go to residency, uh, mm. but I did, you know, a research fellowship in plastic surgery, which can be confusing. It sounds like I did. So it's like plastic pre surgery. Yeah, you know, sure. Pre-surgeon, and something <laughs> like that. But regardless, yeah. I can, I, I can still comfortably answer your question, which is, uh, you know, will this be outpatient or full surgical suite or whatever uh, our goal is for it to be outpatient. So part of what is difficult about scaling medical technology, especially implantable invasive technology is all of the infrastructure that's required in order for somebody to receive that implant. So uh, what's a, a brain implant? I mean, that's, that's easy and factual is a brain implant obviously requires the infrastructure of a full surgical suite, a highly specialized neurosurgeon uh, machines, all kinds of things to be able to put the uh, brain machine interface into a single patient. So with that comes an exorbitant amount of cost uh, to have that infrastructure in place, as well as the scheduling, the OR time. So there's a lot that goes into each patient um, for a single transaction to occur. So to sell one system, all these things have to happen, which prevents it from scaling largely. Um, the more outpatient directed you can get, the more scalable your technology is because outpatient, a lot of people I think probably don't know the difference between outpatient and inpatient surgery. So outpatient is like a surgical center where you go and maybe you spend one night, but usually not. And it's some small procedures. Uh, for example, people are probably familiar with breast augmentation. You would go to an outpatient surgery center, you get a breast augmentation, then you're probably back home the next day. I mean, the same day rather. Um, those are facilities where you still have an operating room, but the surgeries are much quicker, much safer, very low risk, which is why they can be done outside of a hospital environment. Um, and so that's that's what we are uh, gearing towards is being able to implant this in an outpatient setting and being able to have a surgeon that is not specially trained in you know limb surgery specifically for microsurgery or, or neuromuscular surgery. So just a general surgeon to be able to implant something like this, um, and maybe maybe one day even on into uh, someone who's not a surgeon but someone like a dermatologist or or uh, ER physician or, or all these other. Uh, physicians that aren't necessarily classified as surgeons, but they still have invasive training uh, to be able to do procedures um, in line with this. So we're talking about putting an implant in the limbs, which is far safer than doing putting an implant in the brain, in the spinal cord, around a nerve. Um, there are a lot of things that can go wrong when you start messing around with the nervous system, everything from nerves to the brain. You can cause additional injury uh, on top of whatever injury has already occurred um, because of the risk of, of messing with those tissues. Uh, for the nerves, what you really worry about is, uh, let's say a setting of an upper limb amputation. Um, you still have nerves, your big nerves that are in your amputation stump. And so you would think, well, those nerves aren't serving any purpose now. Let's just go and plug into those and, and extract signals and do whatever we got to do. But the problem is, and this is what I did a lot of my research fellowship in, uh, that nerves cause a lot of pain. And so nerves after they've been cut cause a lot of issues. Phantom limb pain is one of the major ones that most people are, are very familiar with, but there's all other, all these other types of pain that occur uh, 
and these patient populations. And so when you go in and you mess with nerves even further, so let's say it's healed kind of, then you go in and you stick some electrodes into that nerve. Well, then you run the risk of causing additional injury to that nerve and additional nerve pain. Uh, and so nerves really don't like to be touched. And so you try to avoid that at all costs. So we are targeting at Phantom Neuro, we're targeting muscle. So muscle is a, a very resilient tissue. Um, you probably, everyone probably knows somebody who's had a, a major muscle tear or a partial muscle tear, muscle tear, you know, they rest and then rehab and then they're back to doing whatever they were doing before. Um, muscle has a very high regenerative capability, but also it's very hard to cause any additional injury. So in the setting of amputation and an amputation stump, those muscles that used to control your hand, if we're talking about upper limb amputation, those muscles in your forearm that used to control your hand are still there. Uh, but now there's no hand to control. So presumably they have no mechanical function, but they are there and you're still able to control them as if your hand is still there. So you think about closing your fist and the muscles in your forearm that used to close your fist, they'll contract and generate electrical activity. So that's how we're able to do what we are doing is you detect that electrical activity. And when you see that and the patient tells you, I'm trying to close my fist, you correlate that signal that you see that's repeatable. Uh, to closing of the fist of the prosthetic. And then you scale that up to pointing your finger, closing your fingers together, turning your wrist, all of those fun things. Um, and so our approach to creating an implant that goes under the skin and, and fat kind of in the amputation stop or limb that rests on top of muscle, uh, that's a very safe approach to human machine interfacing. Uh, you're not touching any tissues that have uh, really any, any capacity to become further injured to the deficit of the person that's receiving this implant. Um, and also, you know, hand surgery and limb surgeries are done with just local anesthetic. So nerve blocks or, or local uh, lidocaine shots, um, things like that are done in an outpatient setting all the time currently. Uh, that's no more or less invasive um, than what we're doing. So it's, it's very reasonable to assume that we can do this outpatient without general anesthesia and just local, uh, local anesthesia, meaning nerve blocks or lidocaine. Um, to be able to receive this implant so you're in and out the door same day with one or two incisions and you know then you let it heal up and then you receive your your prosthetic and sync up and you're ready to go that makes sense the um well one of the one of the downsides of trying to implant something in the brain is like you have to go into the brain because the skull absorbs a lot of the the, the signals which is why i've always felt like sometimes like wearables aren't the best when it, it comes to like brain uh, sensors uh, but when it comes to muscles is there anything that's preventing you? Like why be, is it possible to not be an implant and still have the same fidelity of signal? Uh, so uh, that's a complex question, but the, the practical answer is no. So mm. absolutely surface sensors exist. So Meta, for example, they have a human machine interface um, that is wearable sensors. They basically go around your, your wrist or your forearm area and they're recording muscle signals from underneath. So the identical principle to what we're talking about uh, is the approach that Meta is taking for interacting in the metaverse and controlling your hands in, in the metaverse. Um, there are a few principles that lead, that determine, you know, how good biological signal decoding is. So it's how close are you to the source signal, or there's, let's say there's three, how close are you to the source signal? So the tissue that's actually generating this electrical activity that you're interested in, how big is that signal? Uh, how big and clean is it? So how easy is it to detect? And then how stable is the relationship between your sensor and that tissue over time? So you want a big signal because it's easier to detect. You want to be really close, as close as possible to the tissue that you're trying to record from because it makes the signal bigger and there's less stuff. You were talking about the skull for, for uh, wearable EEG, you know, less stuff such as the skull and scalp and hair between it. Uh, in our case, between it would be you know, the hair on your arm, the fat, the skin, the dirt, the sweat, all of that stuff. Um, and then the stability of the sensor with respect to the tissue that you're recording from. So with these wearable sensors, A, you have to put them on every day, which means that you're changing the position that you're putting it on every day. And even a slight change in position of the sensors can lead to the need to retrain all of your algorithms because you need a very stable relationship. Then when you start talking about sweat, these sensors start to fall off, peel off, slide down your arm. Uh, when you're moving around, there's obviously motion going on in your limbs. And when you're wearing big bulky sensors, they're shaking and like, much like an Apple watch. If you move your wrist around, you'll feel it kind of jostling around on your wrist. All of those things combined 
make it very hard to detect signals from the outside of the body. And so exactly why brain machine interface, you know, is going towards implantable. That's the exact same reason that we're going towards implantable for muscle, uh, because what interacting with muscle is still safe enough that patients would want and be willing to receive something like this. But by going invasive, you're basically solidifying the relationship between the sensors and the muscle because everything heals down and you basically are just putting a, a sensor cuff under the skin, more or less, that becomes healed and fibrosed down. So it's static uh, with respect to the muscles. And then you're also resting directly on top of the muscle now. So it's incredibly easy to detect those signals without anything interfering in between it. Um, and so there are two aspects of this that you can go down. You can go down kind of the augmented reality, virtual reality experience path, or you can go down like the machine control prosthetics and exoskeletons. So perhaps one day, perhaps, and certainly not today, but maybe one day down the road, wearable sensors like that will be able to be used for interactions in the metaverse and the like. Uh, there's still a lot for them to figure out to, to be able to do that, but you probably can get there because you're in a very controlled environment. And you're willing to remain pretty still and do all these things you have to to make it work. But in a real world environment where someone's running or picking up their kid or working or doing whatever, it has to be a very stable human machine interface to be able to still control your prosthetic or your exoskeleton in that environment. And in order to do that, uh, at least for the foreseeable future in our lifetimes, uh, it has to be invasive. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I asked that question because it, it, it was, um, it, well, I was looking online and a lot of people were, were wondering the dichotomy between um, like the meta type thing and implantable. Mm -hmm. So I can definitely see why you'd want to be implantable now. Uh, I can picture it kind of like a submarine on an ocean. You know, the waves can be really choppy, but the submarine is very steady. And so if, mm -hmm. if it's like attached to the bedrock or whatever, and in this case, the muscle, it's even more stable. Um, exactly. Which is when you're trying to get such, we're trying to uh, return the ability to do something. Or I, I can even picture like a really skilled surgeon getting this type of uh, implant so they could use the Da Vinci mechanism even more precisely. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh... For people that are familiar with the Da Vinci, you can imagine or you can look this up, you know, the machine that the surgeon has to get into in order to visualize through it, but then also control. And that, yes, the, the interface that they're actually controlling with are these very intricate little, you know, finger wraps that basically go on. You're controlling these levers and switches and things. Um, but there's all that infrastructure that goes into controlling the Da Vinci, whereas perhaps one day in the future, you could have a surgeon that's wearing, you know, AR glasses and then has implants. Um, and is able to basically one-to-one -one just put into the Da Vinci machine what they're doing based on the movements of what the surgeon's doing as if they're actually operating on the person. So we've talked about, um, and that makes sense as well, the, uh, we've talked about um, registering a signal and then communicating that to a device. Will the devices be able to, as we're manipulating them, will they be able to send a signal back so you feel like some kinetic ability there? So That's a great question. Grabbing a cup, yeah. That's a really good question uh, and one that I get a lot. So the the goal for this is that presumably you want to be able to control your robotic limb as if it's your natural appendage and have a lifelike control. But you also want to be able to sense through your robotic limb and be able to feel touch, hot, cold, you know, scratches, whatever it might be. The goal is to be able to both control and feel uh, through a prosthetic. And so there's a ton of research going on in that, but it's incredibly difficult to do. Uh, because how we perceive sensations is such a complex uh, uh, process. You have all these different types of sensors in your skin um, that decode information in different ways, uh, and then finding those sensory axon endings, you know, presumably they're injured in an amputation setting, um, finding the right axon ending that corresponds to your phantom you know, index finger, uh, all of that can be incredibly challenging. So I think it's on the horizon. There, there are certainly promising things happening in academia where they're able to reconstitute, for example, um, the feeling of temperature, so hot versus cold, by having a prosthetic limb touch something that's hot versus cold, and then the person uh, essentially has their nerves hooked up to um, electrical stimulators, and then you know they find the area that corresponds to their finger uh, on your nerve, and then stimulate until you say, oh, I can feel hot, I can feel cold. And then they correlate those, you know, and somehow sync them up to the, the prosthetic so that when the prosthetic feels hot or cold, it knows where to, where to stimulate on your nerve. And then you can feel that sensation. Um, but it's also not just as simple as you find the axon or you find a, 
sensory bundle that you want to stimulate. And then it's like, oh, okay, there's my cold sensory axons. And if we just impart electrical current into those, then this person's going to feel cold like it's, you know, as if it was really feeling cold uh, with their natural biological limb. Uh, you have to go into all these different parameters of how you stimulate the pulse width, uh, the amplitude, um, you know, the firing rate of the electrical activity, the frequency that is, uh, all those things you have to mess around with so much to be able to just generate a single sensation like cold, uh, that it's not possible to do any of that stuff in a, a commercially relevant environment. So this, so sensory feedback is something that very much is an academic exercise right now, but hopefully one day in the not so distant future, it'll be ready for commercialization. Um, and that plays into what we're doing now. You know, it's, it's just recently that these technologies and this research has gotten to the point where control is ready for prime time uh, in the general public. Uh, and so hopefully once sensory is as well, we'll be able to capitalize that on that too. Um, will the technology you're building now be able to have that upgrade attached to it or is, or does it, are you, I think of it, I don't know how regulatory things work in neurotech, but I imagine you can't change it that much after it's been approved. Right. That's so exactly right. See, so I see something, if, if you get approved in like five years down the line, there's this new thing, but you have to add like a little, little doodad on the chip. Like I imagine that's a huge uh, sequence, but then you can't you can't build for that p potential now with your limited right. resources. Right. So you're absolutely right that with with the FDA, you know, you can't just go make changes to your system all willy nilly. You have to be very methodical about how you do it and go through all the proper processes and approvals uh, to be able to do that. But presumably within the realms of what is possible, um, you will not have to receive an entirely new implant in order to have the benefits of, you know, next generation software or something. So similar to to a Tesla model, for example, uh, having remote updates to the system, the software architecture can give you radically different performance uh, without actually going and changing anything physically about the car itself. Um, there's no reason that you can't also do that with a human machine interface, once again, within the parameters of what's acceptable uh, within the FDA. Uh, but on a more extreme sense, you know, technology is, is rapidly improving. And for example, methods of recharging and, and powering a system uh, could change. So 10 years from now, there may be some radically new and better way to power and charge uh, implantable medical devices. And we would want the ability to incorporate that into our system. And so once again, harkening back to the safety of what we're doing, it's very simple to be able to go in and pull out the strip, you know, uh, sensor device that we put under your skin and then put in a new strip uh, under your skin in the pocket that it, that the ex pre-existing one was already in. And so that can also similarly be done in an outpatient setting. Whereas you can imagine for something like a brain implant or a spinal cord implant, swapping hardware would be an incredibly complex process uh, that would require a lot of time and effort. Uh, for us, that's not necessarily the case. It's it's a very simple procedure to swap out hardware. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. The, um, are we able to discuss the chip in detail or is that like IP? No, I can't. I can't go into the details of uh, okay. how yeah. uh, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and I'm probably not smart enough. Uh, you're probably smarter than me uh, for some of that stuff. So I don't know if I could even answer your questions to the detail that you probably would want me to. That's fair. All right. Well, uh, actually, the previous thing you said transitions to a, a topic I wanted to bring up, which is that does sound like a, an, an advantage in terms of the brain computer interface, the traditional ones that people are thinking about with Neuralink Paradromics and the fact that you can easily update it. Though I think Neuralink is being designed so you can like uh, switch out the hockey puck. But I was curious, how do you see this type of technology stacking up against uh, a more invasive technology that can more uh, deeply integrate with neurons? Like, how do you see, mm -hmm. let's say like 10 years from now, when you have like a perfected neural link, a perfected par paradromics that can really reconnect things and have like, I imagine similar functionality in terms of connecting it to like uh, machines and whatnot. Like, how does it, how does, how does what you're building stay competitive when you have like these more like comprehensive systems? That... I think that's a great question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's definitely a great question. So I would argue that in 10 years, uh, things like that will not be uh, massively adopted by by people other than individuals with extreme injuries, quadriplegia, um, paraplegia, uh, you know, Parkinson's, kind of a lot of the, the use cases that people are already talking about. So I personally fall into the camp of what we're doing is incredibly directed towards patients not towards the sci-fi necessarily. Uh, it's grounded in reality. And, you know, we are trying to help amputees better control their prosthetics. Uh, we are trying to help elderly people 
walk better through the use of assistive exoskeletons. Uh, we very much have medical needs. We are not creating a system that somebody can go control their hands in the metaverse or, you know, go out and, and fly a drone or whatever it might be. Um, that's not really what we're about. And so the risk profile of what people are willing to receive in order to do the things that we're talking about, uh, it differs depending on what the injury is. So what I mean by that is an individual that's quadriplegic is willing to receive a brain implant because they currently have zero function and no ability to take care of themselves and complete dependence on other people. So they're willing to go to the extreme length of receiving a brain implant with the hope that they can control a cursor on screen, communicate, whatever it might be. And upper limb amputee, on the other hand, is still able to have a decent amount of function, you know, and be somewhat self-sufficient, especially if they're unilateral, so only missing one limb. Um, and they generally are not, there have been studies that, that show this population studies of preference. Uh, they're generally not willing to receive a brain implant to have better control of their prosthetic because the risks do not outweigh the potential benefits. And so I believe for our lifetime that harnessing muscle the way that we're doing it in order to control these robotic technologies will be the most natural way to do it. We control our limbs with muscle, so it makes sense and is the most naturalistic way to control robotic appendages. There's also through muscle. I think it'll be the best way to control these technologies, the safest way to control these technologies, and the most desirable way to control these technologies for the demographics that we're going after. So we are not going after individuals with quadriplegia uh, or, or you know Parkinson's or, or any of that generally strokes. Um, you know, we're very targeted in the people that we're going after, and these people don't want a brain implant in order to, to improve their lives. Uh, I certainly won't be signing up to receive a voluntary brain implant anytime soon. And, uh, you know, I think it's important that for this field that people don't get carried away about the science fiction side of it and that, you know, the reality on the ground of, of where things are at and not over-promising um, where this could be in 10 years uh, is something that's important because you create false expectations for patients, right? So if you're out there and you're saying, everybody's going to have these incredible robotic arms 10 years from now, and if whether you're quadriplegic or just an amputee, you know, you're going to have your limbs back and you're going to be able to do everything you want. Uh, that's just simply not the case. And you're creating false expectations for these patient populations. Uh, and so if someone receives that injury and then they see the reality of the situation, uh, that it's nothing like that, then they actually have worse outcomes because of that, because they had these false expectations. And if you remember at the beginning of this, this talk, when I talked about how the government had put in billions of dollars into this over about two decades, yet patient outcomes haven't changed really at all over those two decades. Clearly, it's not as simple as you put money into this new crazy novel thing, and then all of a sudden the world's absolutely changed by it. It's a very slow, uh, progressive process. Um, and I think people need to, to uh, recognize that, when, especially in this novel field. You know, There's really nothing out there in neuroscience yet that's in everyday use uh, for people. And so um, I think it's uh, things will be much slower than perhaps uh, some people would, would want you to believe that it will be. Was there, um, is there, was the limiting factor people like you who are willing to make the steps, gather the IP and a team to, to build the technology? Or was there like a fundamental blocker with, that was preventing the billions from being applied? Uh, so I think, once again, a great question. So I would not, I would not say that there's an, anything inherently special about myself uh, that, you know, makes this happen. I think maybe what's special is that I was willing to take the risk and totally deviate my career trajectory in order to do that. So I think that that in a sense, yes, it required somebody who was willing to take that step in order to start a company in a very difficult field uh, to get funding and to, to move forward with that. But also it's the right place at the right time. Like I said, it's just recently that the technology has actually been proven out enough in the lab to then have application and have the ability for you to be able to translate that out to the general population. Uh, so it's a bit of right place at the right time, but then also, you know, just having the balls to go for it and and take the technology uh, forward. You know, I think I think there should be more people that go and take that leap of faith. But at the same time, it's incredibly difficult, and there's all these barriers to doing so. And so there should ideally be more uh, more of a safety net for people to be able to go do this, or more of an emphasis on people uh, going and doing this, um, so that we have more broad scale impact uh, on the academic advancements that we're doing at these institutions. That makes sense. Uh, and just jumping back to, I know it's like one of their, your weaker parts is the machine learning aspect. 
But when it comes to um, like sensing the data, does the machine learning, is the idea that it'll be somewhat predictive so it can start moving in advance or will it be mm -hmm. um, just converting the data so it can then move the device, if that makes sense? Or is it a yeah. combination of both? Yeah, it's a combination of both. So, so absolutely, you generate, we in our intact limbs sitting here, you generate electrical activity in your muscles before you actually execute the action mm. by definition, right? You have to start some electrical activity uh, that causes your muscle to start to contract. And then you have to reach a certain threshold amount of contraction for the lever and pulley action to actually take place. Just like pulling on something, you have to reach a certain amount of tension before it can actually start pulling the rope down and causing you know, some weight to move up in the air. Um, it's the same with, with uh, your muscles. And so, yes, you can detect electrical activity and send that out of the body before the person would be enacting that action um, within their hand. The reason that this is important uh, isn't necessarily just because we're able to predict what somebody's doing before they're actually would be doing it, but it's because this latency between um, detecting a signal and then enacting a command in a prosthetic, right? Think about all the steps that have to occur uh, in between thinking about doing or attempting to do an action and actually executing that action prosthetic. You have to detect the signal, send the signal out somewhere, process and, and decode the signal, generate the command, send that to the prosthetic, uh, and then have the prosthetic actuate your hand. So the reality is that that happens incredibly quickly, you know, far less than a second uh, to be able to go from signal detection to action uh, in, in the limb. But the fact that you can detect electrical activity before you would have had the motion means that you can reduce the latency uh, of how long it takes to go from trying to execute an action to actually executing it in your prosthetic. So it works to our benefit, even though there's no uh, inherently good thing about detecting this electrical activity early. Uh, it just allows the machine learning algorithms and everything to have a little bit more time to catch up uh, and to be able to do what they need to do, if that makes sense. It does make sense. So would you have to, uh, do you guys ever expect to have to like dial it down so it's more human, like s slow it down a little bit? No. So, so trying to make it human is the hard part somewhat. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happens. So another thing that I think people don't necessarily think about all the time and that I, I didn't think a ton about it is that doing machine learning and then artificial intelligence and all, all of that fun stuff requires a lot of computing power. And, you know, the more collective uh, AI you're using or, or whatever, the more computing power it requires, the bigger the hardware, you know, the hotter the hardware, all of that. And so you could theoretically come up with some supercomputer that can do really quick quantitative stuff to spit out some command to a prosthetic. But if it requires a full laptop, for example, to be able to do that, then it's useless to you for a commercial product because the person is not going to carry around a laptop everywhere they go in order to control their prosthetic. And so what that means is, is that you have to find the right balance between complexity of the machine learning and artificial intelligence versus the computing powder, powder uh, power that you have available to you, uh, where it can still happen quick enough without requiring a whole ton of computing power uh, and large, large um, bulky hardware uh, to do that. And so it's much more fine balance rather than, than just doing everything that you can. That makes sense. The, um, do you uh, are you are you comfortable saying what the tech stack is for the machine learning? I know there's always like tech people, and when they hear about this type of stuff, like no one ever says like, "Oh, it's in Python and you know PyTorch or something." Oh no, I can't talk about I can't talk about that stuff. That's fair. All right, I'll I'll add top secret to the to the thumbnail. Yeah, that, um, that's fine. <laughs> hey, look, you're you're absolutely welcome to ask anything. I'll just be honest with you about what I what I can. No, it's good. Talk. No, it's all right. The the only bad question is the one that uh not asked. Um, I wholeheartedly agree. All right. Uh. When it, when it comes to um, so the the future of giving people the ability to uh interact with the environment. So let's say I don't have a hand and I want to have the ability mm -hmm. to have a hand like thing to interact with the environment. Do you think it's a so I see it as like two different uh, diverging paths. If you if, if, even if you just set aside like the brain computer interface ones like neural link and paradromics, um, where you have like the axolotl approach where you could potentially regrow the limb, and we have uh, your approaches like Luke Skywalker type effect where you can have a, an artificial yes. hand. Um, yes. How do you see the future developing in these and, and with just isolated on those two factors, like rejuvenation versus uh, rank, uh, peripheral computer interface? Yeah. So it's actually so. Once again, 
I, I put things into two buckets. There's theory and kind of science, and then there's like real world, okay, what's actually going to happen, you know, in our lifetime before we die, you know? Um, and so regrowing a limb, so like, like you know, a starfish regrowing, I, I don't think that's our lifetime. I, I don't see that being a, a viable option. But what is and what people have tested is putting on somebody else's limb onto another person's body, right? So a limb transplant. So an upper limb transplant has been done uh, I'll say quite a few, but you know that maybe less than ten. I, I don't know the exact number, but not that many times. Uh, but upper limb transplants have been done. Lower limb transplants have been done, uh, where you put legs onto somebody else's legs onto to a new person. Uh, and so for lower limb, the the outcomes are, are terrible. Uh, a lot of those people don't make it. Um, for upper limb, there's been uh, a mixed bag. So there are some decent outcomes for upper limb transplants. Um, compared to using a prosthesis. So a person that receives uh, a, somebody else's hand sewn onto their hand uh, can generally do a decent amount of things, uh, just like somebody who receives a robotic hand can do, you know, more or less that have been, there have been studies to see what are the outcomes for people that have these two different, um, two different options. And, and they're generally the same, but the downside to receiving uh, these transplants is that you're on chronic immunosuppression in order to have that transplant. So just like uh, bone marrow transplant, heart transplant, uh, liver transplant, you name it, you have to stay on these chronic immunosuppressants, uh, which open you up for increased likelihood of cancer, infection, um, you know, illness, you name it. So there is a massive cost to receiving these limb transplants as a result of having these, these immunosuppressants. And so the outcomes, once you have hopefully our system to be able to control prosthetics will be infinitely better with a robotic prosthetic limb compared to a limb transplant. Uh, you don't have to take immunosuppressants uh, because you're not receiving a transplant, which means that you're not increasing your risk of all these different diseases that are life limiting. Uh, and so there really should be no reason for somebody to receive a limb transplant. I think we'll look back and uh, recognize that that was a crazy experiment that we did. Um, but that's not taking into the account something that's very important, which is that people want to feel whole and human. And so, you know, I'm very into sci-fi type stuff and you probably are too. And so a lot of us feel like, oh my gosh, why wouldn't somebody want this crazy, amazing robotic prosthetic hand or robotic prosthetic leg, all of that. But there's, there's a sizable amount of people who just want to feel whole and quote unquote normal. And so their preference would be to have human limbs if given the option versus using a robotic uh, appendage, which is absolutely reasonable. But I think that the outcomes with robotic appendages are gonna be so blatantly better that it won't even be an option to receive a limb transplant because of all, all the negative side effects and the poor outcomes, with it, especially for lower limb. That's uh, almost never an option. Um, but it, it's definitely a, a complex psychosocial uh, consideration when you're talking about you know biological versus robotic. That makes sense. I think uh, between the two, the dichotomy of a limb transplant or a, a like Luke Skywalker type hand, I'd probably go to Luke Skywalker type hand. Um, but I, I, I was, uh, I think with tissue engineering, where they could clone it from your cells, you wouldn't have the need for the inhibitors. And I, I think if I remember service, they were getting pretty close to being able to, uh, like tissue engineer like a heart. And I think a heart is much more complex than a hand. So then, what's the what's preventing in your mind? like rejuvenation, just like complete, kind of like the axolotl, like regrowing a hand from happening. So I think we've been talking about growing a heart in a Petri dish for, you know, my entire lifetime. So, you know, 30 something years uh, at this point. So once again, theoretically, yes. Can you grow the muscles in a Petri dish and then grow the skin and the bone and then put them all together in the exact right way? And then also somehow build into it the lymphatic system, the vasculature, the nerve, the nervous system. Theoretically, yeah, maybe maybe you can, um, but I'd have to see a whole lot more research, more advanced than anything that I've seen today, to make me think that we're going to be able to grow a biological limb that's uh, you know going to function well and, and then be put on onto a human body and, and not have rejection. You know, it's one of those things that's too good to be true until proven otherwise. I would say that makes sense. Though I I would still hope that within our lifetimes, and I think assuming you're a healthy uh about my age guy you got at least 50 years left i think the average i hope so in, in the 
Well, the U.S. life expectancy has been going down, unfortunately, <laughs> the last couple of years. Which Absolutely. Is not good. But uh, also, like, the, apparently the lifespan is also depending on your income level. Uh, like, uh, apparently poor people live le- uh, shorter lives than well-off people. Well, I think, I mean, that's, that's such a complex topic. But, of course, I mean, you, have, you, you just inherently have access to, you know, a better diet with nutrition, uh, increased mm-hmm. ability to exercise. You less know, stress. More mental, less well, yeah, maybe, probably, honestly, uh, you know, you're using your brain, I guess, because you're doing this, you know, computer jobs and all these things. Uh, so I think they're, they're, that's, that's so multifactorial. Um, but, uh, you know, I agree. I hope that we can regrow limbs and uh, do all of these incredible things. Uh, and I guess, I guess time will tell. Yeah. Is there, uh, is there something you're looking forward to just in the next couple of years in terms of development, either in the space that we're talking about? I mean, you're at a conference right now, so maybe you're hearing some like cool stuff that is going on. Is there like a, a bit of technology or there's an aspect of what you're building in the next couple of years in the pipeline? They're really excited. To, so either what's out in the space they're excited about or what are you building in the next couple of years that you're like really interested to see come into fruition? So I think in the next couple of years, we hope to, to put our stuff into humans. And so I'm incredibly excited to see our technology actually make it out to patients uh, be implemented for, for prosthetic control. So I think that's wildly exciting. And then also, of course, being at a conference like this, this neuroscience one, you see all these incredible things that people are working on. Uh, and then similarly, I have a whole bunch of friends that have startups or very advanced companies who are working some on some incredible things. So I think overall, I'm an incredibly optimistic person about the future of humanity and where we're headed. There's a lot of really great people working on really great things. And, you know, look, we're talking about going to space and colonizing the moon and Mars. And, you know, what used to be nothing but a dream is now a, a very, you know, not so distant um, reality. And so, you know, and that, that also plays in, into part of why I'm doing this as well is, you know, what it means to be human and human capabilities will certainly change uh, as we start moving into different uh, environments outside of earth, right? Our biology is only, only optimized for this very specific environment, which is earth that we exist in. When you start going into low gravity, different types of gravity um, for long space travel, there's a lot of stuff uh, about our biology that's no longer compatible. And so the question is, how do you, how do you optimize the human body and human performance to operate in these different environments? And I think that technology is going to be a very big part of that uh, and harnessing technology to help you, you uh, function in all these different environments. So it's crazy to be able to even have this kind of a conversation uh, and for it to be something that will be possible in our lifetimes. I think that's amazing. Um, mm-hmm. So there's all kinds of stuff that I'm really excited about uh, that's on the horizon. Yeah, I think this is a, uh, the news makes it seem like it's a very dangerous time, but it's actually like the least dangerous time in like 30 years. It's the safest it's, time. You got to turn look, it off. Can, I, oh, well, I, I try not to listen to the news ever. Yeah, it's horrible. Uh, yeah, I try not to talk politics, listen to the news. I think that we live in an amazing world uh, with amazing people. And if you put your head down and you do stuff that you're excited about, that's helping the world around you, um, you know, that's all you can do. At the end of the day, I like to say none of us are making that out of this alive, you know, so you might as well have fun, be happy and optimistic uh, while you're here. Yeah, you have a life sentence. But, uh, that, if that's you ever, right. Uh, something I've, uh, I've noticed, like with the news or when you're like on Twitter or whatever, like you get the impression that other people are like evil or like whatever. It's, uh-huh. it's usually like related to politics. I encourage anyone. I'm from the Midwest, but like just walk down. Like I'm from an area. Where, like literally everyone smiles and says hello to you. I don't know who any of them are. <laughs> so like, I, I was I can, in uh, Austin, Texas. People are doing the same thing. Just get out and say hi. Right. Someone. I mean, that's I'm I'm from Austin, Texas, and people are nice. You go out, everybody is getting along. There is there's nothing like what social media would lead you to believe. Uh, yeah. I have nothing but positive experiences in my daily life, and I think part of it is you know you reap what you sow, and you if you put out positive energy into the world, it will come right back at you. But uh. The world's not nearly as bad as, as one might think when you're staring at a screen. Uh, so I encourage people to get out there and, and actually talk to people. I wonder if the social media encourages that type of thought process so you stay on the social media. That'd be, that'd be I, interesting to look into. I think so. I think, uh, you know, I, social media has been so good in so many ways, but also so bad in so many ways. And I, I personally don't don't really use it. And uh, But it's a mixed bag for sure. So this next question is a bit of a transition, but I've been enjoying uh, asking this question because uh, maybe this was stupid, but I thought for some reason that like happiness was relatively u- uniform, like how, what you experience or what think of as happiness 
is like relatively what I think is mm-hmm. happiness. But apparently, like everyone changes, and so I've been asking people like, when you think of happiness, like how how do you define it? Like what does it actually mean to you? That's really hard. That's probably the hardest question you've asked me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For my for myself personally, so I'm, I'm a very introspective. Uh, you know, you know, I just went from saying, "Oh, the world's so bright and sunny, and uh, everyone's <laughs> so happy, and the birds are always chirping." So now, like, oh, I'm very introspective and, and brooding. But um, no, I think about this a lot, and I don't know what happiness is. And I, I don't. I think I, I'm the kind of person that's never satisfied, right? So I, I, there's no milestone out there that I can imagine. No amount of money, no, mm. you know, whatever, where I can be like, okay, gosh, I think I've made it, and I can die happy now. I generally believe that I will always want to do more and be restless. Uh, and so, you know, happiness to me is, I guess, knowing that I'm I'm out there striving to do something that I view as important and that that uh, makes me feel content about what it is that I'm doing. Um, but I'd say it's very rare that I ever sit there and I'm like, gosh, I'm just super happy right now and smelling the roses. Uh, I think it's, that's one of the harder questions I've been asked because I really don't know how to how to say what it is. What is it for you? Uh, no, it's very similar. Like so, uh, like people who build things have a little bit more of achievement based happiness. Where like if I I was like talking to like a janitor or a maintenance expert, or I don't like the proper way to say their their title. I, they call it janitor, but um, sanitation expert. Yeah, san- sanitation specialist. Uh, they were they were telling me like happiness to them is just like staying with their family, and uh, like making memories and stuff. So it's like, um. I, it, that's where I was like, oh, wow, it's different for other people. And then once I understood that and heard like the different ways that people experience happiness, like then I can see uh, more clearly, like how to align their interests with if we're doing stuff together, like they're more experience based. So then we do some experience. If I'm ta- like, we're doing something, I'm going to probably suggest like a hike, for instance, like so we can for like, sure. achieve something. Well, you know, so like, uh, and if you go travel the world or are able to go over, you know, to somewhere that, that has, I guess a lower socioeconomic status as a country. Uh, generally, I would argue that they're happier than we are here in the United States. And I, I think, you know, with simplicity of life comes uh, probably more happiness. So I think that the rat race of the United States, even though I, I wouldn't change it, I absolutely love the rat race that I'm living in. Um, I think that it it degrades from happiness compared to probably other populations out there. Uh, so it's something I think about a lot, you know what does it mean to be happy and what's what's really the point you know if we all end up uh you know not making it out of this alive what should you do should you just optimize your happiness and just kind of relax and do you know uh, the least resistance path of least resistance or should you go big and go home and basically you know forget about everything else in your life uh to be able to achieve this one thing uh, i still go back and forth well uh it sounds like your happiness wouldn't be the relaxing happiness. Your happiness, it, it would. I don't think you're, it would. Yeah, if you're maximizing for happiness, it would be achieving the most. From what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but like I said, there's no, there's no achievement. I mean, yeah. Uh, and at the same token, you know, I, I love to hike, like you just said, and I guess the most peaceful moments in my life have been sitting under a tree in the mountains, you know, staring off into the abyss by myself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. Uh, then, uh, is there a skill right now that you're actually trying to develop and get better at? This isn't, a, I guess, a very interesting answer, but I, I would say leadership is probably the mm-hmm. skill. So, I, I wish I had more, you know, a bandwidth or or ability to focus to learn a new skill or a new language or something like that. But I think that as my team is growing internally, it's I'm learning how to be a leader um, with them for them and how to draw people in you know towards a common goal and it's difficult as you scale a team uh, and start you know moving past one or two people uh because there's a whole bunch of people that you're trying to align with incentives and everything uh towards the same common goal and like we were talking i think before we started this you know um it can be difficult to to find people that share the same passion and share share all that i've been very fortunate thus far but uh Leadership is something I do listen to a lot of audiobooks on and uh, am trying to hone my skills in. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, well, the next question is going to be about books. So I'm, I'll start by recommending two to you. I'm looking at one of them. It's called Work Rules. It's about basically how to hire and get people to do their best in a team. And the other one is called uh, 
Creativity Inc. It's basically mm-hmm. how Pixar structured their teams, their management teams, so they could build uh, and oh, make awesome. really great um, movies. And I think Pixar has never made a bad movie. At least I can't remember it. Not that um, I'm aware. So those are two that I recommend. But what are some books or books that you recommend? Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm currently listening to the what is it? The Trillion Dollar Coach, I believe. It's mm-hmm. about you know a coach. The Google um, guy. I, yeah. Eric so Schmidt? he used to. Uh, is that his name? That he was the Schmidt, uh, Schmidt. coach. It might be. He passed away. Um, mm-hmm. I'll have to. I'll send so it the, to you after. But the Google guy is alive, so it's not him. No, so it's not him. Uh, let me pull it up here on my phone because it's actually worth it. I I know what you're talking trillion, about. Trillion I've dollar coach. Uh, where's the guy's name? I'm not super far into it, so that's. Uh, oh, it is Eric, Eric Schmidt, Jonathan Rosenberg. Uh, Bill Campbell is his name. Mm-hmm. Bill Campbell was his name. And so he was a coach, that, he was a football coach at some university. I can't re- remember which one. Uh, anyways, he wasn't a good coach, but his team loved him. And then he somehow found his way into Silicon Valley being uh, a leadership coach um, or an executive coach for basically all the top executives um, like Steve Jobs uh, and and kind of the principles of team building and stuff that he had and held dear. Um, another thing that I, I read recently that's not related to leadership or anything uh, was Project Paperclip, and basically about how during World mm-hmm. War II, you know, bringing over Nazi scientists to help build out infrastructure here in the United States, and that a lot of the technologies that we now take for granted really are sourced from um, Nazi scientists after World War II. And I think that I think that it's really interesting how we, you know, wars and kind of ugly things uh, shape the future of humanity. Sometimes in ways that we're not proud of, but you know, I don't think that we would give up our cell phones or, or we, it'd be hard to not have those kinds of technologies in our lives now. And, uh, but it's interesting to think about the kind of cynical past of some of it uh, and where these technologies came from. Yeah, the, I think everything we know about hypothermia came from exactly some very bad experiments that are being some done. Very bad experiments. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it's horrible, but also it is part of, I guess, our history. And now it helps us with aviation and, Navy and all of that, and it's terrible. But, anyways, I find it interesting to learn about uh, how all of these things interconnect. Yeah, I think there's a. You should tr- uh, try and check out. I think it's like um, Lab Three Twenty One or whatever. The the Japanese because the Japanese had a similar thing to the Nazis in terms of what they were doing oh, really? to the Chinese and Americans. Yeah, although they were horrible. Uh, most people don't talk about them. Like, uh, there's like certain keywords I could say that would guarantee like the internet would take down the, this thing. But if you Google Japan. Uh, and Nanking, for instance, um, the Japanese were ar- arguably maybe even worse than the, the, the Nazis. That's crazy. Um, I mean, but, but there's a whole group that uh, did stuff just like the Nazis that we paperclipped as well. That's crazy. Um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I just find history and I also do like war history and, and all of that. So I find it fascinating. Uh, is there a war that you I'll- like in particular? World War II is, I mean, I can't say I have a favorite war, but I think that all of the, <laughs> yeah. I think all the technology and like uh, the socioeconomics of it and how Hitler came to be and everything, mm-hmm. you know, from World War I leading into World War II, I just find it all fascinating how like also how one person can have this insane impact on the entire future of humanity and the entire globe. Um, it's pretty nice. It, uh, interesting enough. There's a there's a series of books, and the first one's called The Coming of the Third Reich. It's really good, and it'll kind of shift the last sentence you just said. It wasn't really Hitler as it was as much as the people around Hitler that allowed Hitler to be Hitler. And that book, the trilogy of books, starting with The Coming of the Third Reich, is a, a great series I recommend to you. Interesting. Really yeah, I'll have to read that yeah. too. Uh, I mean, I guess there's, yeah, there's weird a lot of leadership people. principles in there too. <laughs> Well, I'll I'll try not to incorporate too many of those, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, but uh, I mean, look, he, he got an entire population to kind of follow along with these crazy ideas, and uh, I mean, I don't know, it's interesting, and I feel like you learn a lot by studying history, good and bad, for sure. I agree. And uh, so then the last uh, question, I won't ask the other ones. Um, how can people <laughs> stay up to date with what you're working on? Is there like a newsletter you have going on? Is there? I know you have a Twitter. But if people want to just stay on the cutting edge of what you're doing, I know the investors get the inside track, but you know, they, for people they certainly do. <laughs> they pay a little bit for that. But uh, yes. um, I think checking our website, uh, you know, we, we typically put job postings up there when we have them. We always have an open listing for people that are interested in um, 
job opportunities that may be here, even if there's not one listed on there. And then we also keep the most up-to-date news about, about the company listed there too. And we're looking for some really exciting things to happen at the beginning, uh, end of this year, beginning of next year, um, to really show what we're capable of. Uh, we have some pretty wild things in the pipeline. So hopefully people will stay tuned and excited and, uh, you know, continue to look for information about us. Sweet. Yeah. And the, the links to everything will be in the show notes. I would encourage just like a quarterly newsletter. Uh, but at the same time, you kind of don't need one as long as you're entertaining the investors and the would-be investors. Yeah, right. Keep the investors happy and nothing else really matters. But uh, yeah. uh, not not really. But uh, yeah, no, I, I you're right. I should I should see if someone in my team has time to, to spin up a, a quarterly, news, quarterly newsletter for people that, the handful of people maybe that would be interested. You probably get a couple thousand. You get a lot of people interested in what you're doing. Also, uh, just take like the one that you send to investors and just dial it down in terms of IP. And then yeah, that's that's a good idea. Yeah, that's a, it, that's actually a very good idea. It could literally just be like four lines, hired three yeah. people, looking for two more. You know. Yeah, that's a good idea. I should do that. You know, um, I'll market. do that. And then and then LinkedIn LinkedIn's also the the where we're the most active uh, for putting stuff up. Thank you for joining us today with the Learn with Lowell show. Check us out at learnwithlowell.com. Anywhere podcasts can be found, subscribe, tell me what you thought of this episode. Check us out on YouTube in particular. It's a new thing I'm doing. Uh, Timestamps and links are in the show notes. Thank you for coming. And I hope everyone, every one of you found something today that you're curious about to learn more about. And you'll go out and be curious and learn something new. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.